Good morning. Good morning to each and every one. Happy New Year to all of you. This is the first Sunday of the year 2024. You know, I would like also to greet our online worshipers. Good morning to all of you and Happy New Year as well. Welcome once again to Ebenezer Community Alliance Church. You know, last year, 2023, was the first post-pandemic year. And we thank the Lord after three long years, face mask was not a requirement anymore. Parties and gatherings were already allowed. People started to move around, traveled from one city to the other, from one country to the other. They move around excited. However, last year was also the year that many Christians started to slowly deteriorate spiritually. Unlike during the pandemic, many people were attending Bible study, going and attending prayer meeting online. But when the pandemic ended, many Christians were drifting away because they became busier for work and travel. Prayer and reading God's Word were becoming less and less important. Do you agree? Yeah. Let me ask you this question. How was your spiritual life and well-being in 2023? Did it deteriorate or was it amazingly great? And what do you intend to do for this year 2024? Before we proceed, let us pause for a moment of prayer. Please pray for me. Not feeling well, not feeling again well. Uh, I thought I'm going to lose again my voice. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity you have given to me, O oh Lord. The first Sunday of the year to preach your word. May you give me the power, the wisdom that, be, that I will be able to share your word clearly and with power. I pray, O oh Lord, for the congregation that you are going to give them wisdom to understand the message clearly and what you have to say. Thank you also for our online worshipers as they are listening to us this morning. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You know, as a medical doctor, as a medical doctor, I could assess a patient if he is doing very well by evaluating and doing my initial assessment. And how do I do that? I use the vital signs. You know what a vital signs is? Vital signs are measurements of the body's most basic function. The most common vital signs are the five that I'd like to show to you. And these are the blood pressure, respiratory rate, heart rate, body temperature, and oxygen saturation. Now, why is it so important to monitor the vital signs of an individual? It's because these are indicators of a patient's health status, whether he is okay or not okay. If outside of the normal range, they may point out to a dysfunction or a diseased entity. For example, when a patient collapses, the first thing you're going to do is to get 
his respiratory rate. You have to look at him whether he is breathing or not. How do you know if he is breathing or not? You just look at the chest. If it is moving upward and downward, that means he is breathing. Or you could use at the back of your hands, put those hands at the nose and you could feel the air, meaning the patient is breathing normally and is alive. If the rate, you know, the normal rate, the normal rate of the respiratory rate is about 16 to 20 per minute. There are times it extremely goes up. You take a look if the patient is, you try to see if, if the patient probably, he saw a crack, cockroach or a lizard. The respiratory rate also increases. If he is not breathing, most likely he's dead. So that's how vital sign is very important. Secondly, you look at his blood pressure or his pulse rate rather. The heart rate normally is about 60 to 90 per minute. You just touch the pulse. The normal rate is 60 to 90 per minute. Anything above is called palpitation or tachycardia. Sorry for using medical terms. If the rate below 60, that means bradycardia, meaning slow rate. And it's common for people who are athletes. When you feel someone's pulse, you don't only count the rate. You look at the rhythm. The rhythm where it is regular or irregular. Patients who have heart attack will have an irregular rhythm. If the patient is between 16 to 24 or 26 years old and you touch his pulse and it's above 90, probably she saw her crash. And that's normal. The next is the blood pressure. 140 over 90 and above is considered hypertension or hypertensive patient. You must see a doctor already. If your blood pressure is 90 over 60 or less, that's hypotension. It's not anemic, but it's hypotension, as many laymen would interpret. The next one is the body temperature. Any temperature, 37.8 and above, is considered fever. Now, take notice, Fever is not a disease. It's the response of the body fighting against the bacteria, the virus, and trauma. You will have fever. When you have fever, it means your body is responsive and fighting the enemies and all kinds of bugs. And the last vital sign that is crucial is called the oxygen saturation. How do you measure it? It's just like a clip placed in your finger and then it will read. If the oxygen level is 95% and below, that means your patient lacks oxygen in the circulation. Now that vital sign was very commonly used during the pandemic. Why? Because COVID attacked the lungs. When it attacks the lungs, the oxygen level goes down. You will notice when the patient comes in, that clip is placed right away. Because it will tell you if the patient is serious or not. These vital signs, all of these five vital signs are very important for the physical well-being of an individual. Now, just like the spiritual life, we could also monitor our spiritual vital signs. And these signs will tell us of our status 
of our spiritual well-being. This morning, I am going to share to you five spiritual vital signs. As we start the year 2024, let us monitor these five vital signs and make sure they are present in you and is functioning well to stay on track with our spiritual life. It's very easy to remember because I call it the five Ds. Are you ready? Are you all awake? Spiritual vital sign number one, desire to be holy. Now in Ephesians 1.4, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. Now, Miriam Dictionary defines holy as a religious or morally good exalted or worthy, complete devotion. Now listen to this. As one that is perfect in goodness and righteousness. Perfect in goodness and righteousness. If this is the meaning of holy, no human beings will be qualified. You agree? Because no one is good no one is righteous, and most especially, no one is perfect. The Bible confirms it in Romans 3.10. No one is righteous, not even one. Therefore, how can we have the desire to be holy when in fact, it is impossible. You cannot. How is the word holy defined in the Hebrew language? Every Hebrew word is usually built on a three consonant root word. Often, many words close in meaning, they can share the same root. The Hebrew word for holy is Kodesh. And it comes from the root word Kadesh. The root word, the root word is Kadesh. When the Bible, it only means, it only means the root word in simpler term, it means to be set apart for a specific purpose. That's the definition. Now, when the Bible calls something holy, it is not speaking of purity or righteousness. But rather, it is something that is set apart from everything else in order to accomplish something specific. For example, you will hear the word Holy Land, which refers to Israel. When you hear that word Holy Land, it does not mean that land of Israel is perfect and righteous, but rather it means the land is set apart for a specific purpose. Israel is the land where Jesus Christ, Savior of the world, was born. It was also the land that Jesus is going to come again for the second coming. It is set apart. Therefore, the word holy does not mean you live a sinless and perfect life but you are set apart from the evils of the world and useful for the kingdom of God. Now, holiness is not about absolute perfect, 
absolutely perfect. But instead, it's about being separated from what is sinful. We cannot make ourselves perfect and blameless, but we can choose to be set apart for God. Thus, we can choose to be holy. Therefore, therefore, a desire to be holy is not to be sinless, but to sin less and less and less. For example, when you're attending a class reunion, especially high school reunion, it is not bad, it is not unrighteous to attend a reunion. In fact, I encourage you to attend reunion. Why? Because you will be able to show, then be an example of holiness to your batchmates. What do I mean by that? During a reunion, especially high school, there are cases of beer, cigarettes everywhere. And they get drunk. Now, setting yourself apart is not joining them in the drinking and smoking spree. Setting apart is not joining them in their filthy languages and filthy jokes. Foul languages. You set yourself apart. You have that desire not to sin. You have that desire to set apart from sinning. Again, having that desire to be holy is, to be, is not to be completely sinless, but rather having that desire, having that desire to say no to sin because it should be our lifestyle. The desire to be holy is my number one spiritual vital sign of well-being. Check this vital sign if it is present in you. Number two, the desire to read God's Word. Reading God's Word is one of the main vital signs that we can use if we are spiritually in tune with God. In 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. In other words, the Scripture makes the man complete and equipped. Studying and not only reading God's Word will reveal to us God's promises. God's Word will teach us how to obey Him. God's Word will show to us how to love one another when we are changed to become more like Jesus, our families, workplaces, and communities will be eternally impacted. The Bible will lead us to be more like Jesus. Becoming like Christ, listen to this, becoming like Christ is the better evidence of salvation for salvation and sanctification. You know, the Bible is like a compass. It's a guide for us how to live our lives. The psalmist compared the Bible as the lamp of God. In Psalms 119-105, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It's a lamp that provides light to illuminate the path of life. It's 
a guide for those who are pursuing God. You know, when the psalmist was adrift in chaotic waters of life, he knew, he knew that God will use the Scripture to bring him back, to provide him spiritual latitude and longitude and help him survive and bring him back to his holy presence. Listen again. You will notice when you are not in tune with God, the first thing that loses is our appetite to read God's Word. Have you experienced? Am I correct? When we are busy with our work, when we are busy with our lives, we feel that 24 hours in a day is insufficient that reading God's Word is not and cannot be part of our daily lives, our daily schedules. We only start to open it again when we are depressed. We open it again when we get sick, when we encounter problems and difficulties in life, and we need an answer. So we open the Bible. But when everything is just in our hands, when everything is provided for reading the Bible, is the last thing that we will do, and we do. Many times, Reading God's Word is only every Sunday. And you call it Sunday book. But mind you, mind you, we are all guilty of this. We don't fail to open our Facebook, Netflix, Twitter daily. And yet, we don't do it and we don't treat the Bible likewise. During the pandemic, my brother and I started a group called Life Discovery Group, where we conducted Bible study online with our colleagues, doctors, nurses, and med techs. Those who were attending were about 40 plus in attendance when we started in November 2020. It's an online Bible study every other Saturday, 7.30 to 9.30. But when the pandemic was slowly declining, the number of doctors attending were also declining. Simply because they start to become busy with work, and travel. Studying the Bible is becoming less and less important. You know, my friends, it's a cycle. It, it's a cycle. When we are in trouble, that's what we find time reading the Bible. But when we are not in trouble, we forget reading the Bible. Reading and studying the Bible is a vital sign is an important vital sign about our spiritual well-being. When we are spiritually attuned with God, we are always hungry to know more about Him. We want to know more about Jesus Christ. We, know to know, we want to know more about God. What we do is to read the Bible. The question is, how about you? Do you read God's Word daily? Is it part of your daily life? Or it's just a Sunday book? Do you have the desire to read and study the Bible? Answer it to yourself. Third, the desire to pray. In 1 Thessalonians 5.16, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Now, what is prayer? The dictionary defines prayer as a solemn request for help 
or expression of thanks addressed to God or an object of worship. Now, in other words, prayer is a way of relating to God, to ourselves, and to those around us. Prayer is a communication to God. It is done by those who trust in the power of the word and thought. Prayer can be spoken, prayer can be unspoken, or prayer can be in a form of a song. It can, it can, it can be used to praise God or to ask something, including help and forgiveness. Now the question is, what is the true meaning of prayer? Many people think that when they hear the term prayer, immediately they think that it means coming before God for supplication. Because man is in want and man is in need of material supply, when man is sick, needs healing, has problems and needs for solution, he goes to God and asks Him to supply his needs heal his sickness, and solve his problems, men consider this prayer. If we desire to know the real meaning of prayer, we must clearly realize that it is not merely men making supplication before God. It's not all about asking God for this and that. A real prayer is a mutual contact between God and men. Prayer is not just men contacting God, but prayer is also God contacting men through His Word, the Bible. The highest and the most accurate meaning of prayer that it is a mutual contact between God and man. You just don't talk to God for the sake of talking and asking. You passionately and fervently share to God what is in your heart and what is in your mind. Jesus prayed fervently in Luke 22:44, And being in agony, He was praying very fervently and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. A true prayer is telling God what is in your heart and communicating with God as you grasp his will and his word. Feeling especially close to God, sensing he is there before you and believing you have something to say. Your heart fills with light and you feel how lovable God is. That is the true meaning of prayer. And that is prayer. And prayer is a very important vital sign for the spiritual well-being of an individual. You know, prayer and reading God's Word almost always goes together. And these are the two main vital signs that disappears when we are slipping away from God. The desire to pray comes only. The desire to pray comes only when we are in need. But when in everything is available, everything is there, everything is in place. Everything is just in our reach. Prayer now becomes secondary. We thought that prayer is just supplication. We go, to, we, go, we go to God in prayer only to ask for our needs, protection, and trouble. When we lose our desire to pray and to read God's Word, check our spiritual life. Check. Most of the time, when we lose this appetite to pray and to read God's Word, it's because of sin. Sin, S-I-N, that we are not mindful of. And it is slowly creeping into our lives. 
Right now, I want you to close your eyes for 30 seconds. Close your eyes for 30 seconds, everyone. Think about this question. Is it, is it, is that vital signs of prayer and reading God's Word is still part of your spiritual life? Now open your eyes. When you reach home later, examine your heart and mind and ask the question, are you, am I attuned with God? I want you to tap your neighbor on your right. Tap his shoulder on your right. And, and ask him, do you pray and read God's word every day? And then turn on your left. Tap the shoulder of your seatmate over there. Hey, wake up. Stop playing with your cell phones. Listen to Dr. Sam. You know, a desire to have prayer as part of your daily lives is a vital sign of spiritual well-being. Fourth, desire to serve and share. Now, this photo, next slide, Jesus showed to us a servant attitude in John chapter 13, verses 1 to 5. It was during this time, during the week of the crucifixion, Jesus had the last supper with his disciples before his death. And Jesus got a basin filled with water, and he started to wash the feet of his disciples. And Peter initially refused his feet to be washed. But Jesus said, unless I wash your feet, you have no part of me. Jesus was saying to his disciples in verse 13 and 14, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Washing the disciples' feet by Jesus was a symbol of servant attitude who was willing to serve rather than to be served. You know, to serve God and to serve our neighbors, you don't have to go to Bible school. You don't have to be a pastor or a pastora to serve the Lord. You can serve God in your own profession, your calling, you can serve Him anywhere. You can serve the Lord as an elder, as a deacon, as a deaconess. You can serve the Lord as the secretary, the treasurer, financial secretary, or even a cook or a janitor washing dishes. That is serving if your reason you cannot serve because you are busy at work or you're getting too old and you don't have time to serve, you're only available during Sunday worship to sit and just listen to the sermon and go home. Check this vital sign. Do you have the desire to serve? Pastor Chris Rogers from Liverpool Baptist Church in United Kingdom once said, and I quote, how I wish every day is a Sunday. His desire to serve the Lord was every day. One question was asked again to a well-known pastor, how do you convince your children to serve the Lord? And this was his answer and said, I don't convince my children, the moment they receive the Lord Jesus Christ in their lives and they totally give their lives to Christ, the Holy Spirit will automatically convince them to serve the Lord. Just like us, when we have Christ in our lives, when we accepted Him as our Lord and Savior, it's automatic. We want to serve. 
And we don't only want to serve, we want to share God's Word to others. Not because it's a command in Matthew 28, 19, the Great Commission that we should share, but the moment the indwelling Holy Spirit is in us, it's automatic. We want to share God's Word to others. We want others to experience the salvation that we experience. You are excited to share your personal experience, your personal encounter with Jesus Christ. And you want to share it not only to your friends, but also to your family who do not know Jesus Christ. The desire to serve and share is the direct outcome of spiritual well-being. Now, let me bring you to the last. The fifth one. The desire to live a balanced life. Now, in Romans 12:1, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, let me bring you to a quick glance at the etymological dictionary or the origin of the word. The word holy is derived from the old English word hal, which also the word whole is derived from. In other words, Paul is saying to us to holy offer our bodies and mind free from sin free from sin, in conformity to this world, this becomes our spiritual service of worship. We must take care of our physical bodies as well as our spiritual well-being and offer it to the Lord. You know, many Christians, even pastors, many pastors, don't take care of their bodies. They just concentrate on their spiritual life. Even if they die, are diagnosed of diabetes mellitus, they are diagnosed of hypertension, and the doctor says, avoid these certain kinds of food, they don't listen. When they are diagnosed with diabetes, don't drink soft drinks, they do the opposite. They drink soft drinks. They cannot eat breakfast, lunch, dinner without soft drinks. They do the opposite. And when they get sick, they ask their members or their other friends, please pray for me to heal my diabetes. You look for it. Now you're asking God to heal it. Living a balanced life is not only spiritual. It's not only spiritual. It's not only preaching the word, sharing, living a balanced life is also our physical well-being. It's not only bad food that destroys our physical bodies, but also our sleep. Even pastors or long-time Christians miss this because they want to serve the Lord and do all the service act for God. They skip lunches. They don't eat breakfast just to finish their job and do it everything. They don't get enough sleep to prepare for church activities because they push themselves too far, more than their body can handle, and that is not healthy. Yes, we are called to serve the Lord. We are called to serve the Lord, but not, but God did not tell us to allow it to be at the expense of our bodies. Our body is a temple of God and we should take care of it. A desire to live a balanced life is to take care of our spiritual life and our physical life, offering it to God as a whole, as our spiritual form of worship.
as we enter 2024, I encourage you to check these vital signs. Are these five spiritual vital signs functioning? Do you have the five Ds? Desire to be holy. Desire to read God's Word. Desire to pray. Desire to serve. A desire to live a balanced life. I do not conclude these are the only five vital signs. Perhaps there are more. But we can start with the five. Look at these five vital signs as you face 2024. As you go home later, take a breather. Reflect. How is your battle with sin? Is the desire to say no to sin strong? How is your daily schedule? Is your desire to read God's Word so potent that you make time for it? How is your spiritual life? Do you spend an intimate communication with God desiring to share your life with Him or you just use your time, in, you just go to God in time when you are in need. How about your service? Do you have that willingness to, to sacrifice and offer your time and service for the Lord? How is your physical well-being? Do you take care of your bodies as you should? Check these vital signs. Monitor them regularly. Just as when the person's blood pressure gets too high, or their pulse rate and rhythm becomes irregular, or the temperature gets too high, that they seek help and make some changes in their lives, your spiritual vital signs might be telling you to make some changes as well in your life. Act accordingly. With this reminder, may we all bravely and continually strive to grow and strive in our spiritual walk with God as we enter 2024. Check the spiritual vital signs. Let me end with a story. The administration of the hospital where I do my surgeries held a contest and offered a prize money for the most beautifully decorated ward for Christmas this year. This photo is one of the wards and look how they decorated it. There were comments that decoration is so beautiful except for the cross placed at the manger. They said that that cross represents Holy Week and not Christmas. Therefore, that cross should not be there. The next photo is another word. And look at the difference in their design. Who is sitting on the chair? It's Santa. Between the two words, let me ask you, who do you think won? The one with the cross or the one with Santa Claus? The one who won the contest received the award for the most beautiful word is the second picture, the one with Santa Claus. The judges completely missed the point of Christmas. It's not about Santa Claus. It's not about the parties. It's not about the reunion. It's not about the food and the gifts we receive. It's about Jesus. 
the reason for the season. The first word got it right. Christmas does not end at the birth of Jesus. But Christmas signifies the beginning. He was born to die, to pay the penalty of our sins. Therefore, that cross is there. And it should be there. If Jesus did not die, and there was no resurrection, Christmas is meaningless. Christmas is useless. It's incomplete. I shared that story because I want to remind everyone in monitoring our spiritual vital signs, Jesus should be our focus. Jesus should be the center. He should be our standard when we check our spiritual vital signs. Let us not miss the whole point. The Apostle Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Our aim is to be like Jesus. Jesus is our King who was a servant all the way to the cross. And through regularly monitoring our spiritual signs, our focus and our standard is Jesus. May we continue the fight, the good fight, and walk the path of Jesus. Let us pray. Let us close our eyes. All of us are guilty. All of us are guilty of some of the spiritual signs that we failed to do. I want to pray for you. I will pray not only for myself, but I also want to pray for you. If you want to pray for me by standing, you feel that there are vital signs that you did not feel. You may stand right now and I'm going to pray for you. Don't look at your seatmates. Look at God. Look at Jesus. Father in heaven, look at your people who are standing right now. We are all guilty. Guilty. Uh, one of the five vital signs. We failed to pass. Perhaps some of us, Lord, loses the time to pray, doesn't have the time to read God's Word. Sometimes we fail to set apart to be holy. We follow what others are doing. We fail to say no to sin. Forgive us, Father in heaven. Forgive us from our sins. Forgive us from our iniquities. Right now, oh God, thank you for your word and your reminder that you're going to give us strength as we face 2024. As we look up, look up Lord, to Jesus as our standard to follow, may you always give us, O oh Lord, the time to pray and spend time in praying, the time to read your word, the time and the desire to say no to sin,
and the desire to live a balanced life and a desire to serve and share God's Word to others. Thank you, Lord, for your reminder. Lord, are these people standing something in their heart, something in their mind? They want to tell you, O oh, Father, that you're going to deal with each one of their desires. May you protect them, O oh Lord, and guide them and be a blessing, that they will be a blessing to others. Thank you, Lord, for this fellowship, this congregation. Thank you for your word. I pray that you continue, Lord, to use us and bless us and make us a channel of blessing to others. Thank you, Father, for the answers to our prayers, Lord. We thank you and we thank you for everything. Lord, as we take and remind us, O oh Lord, as we take the communion today, as you remind us once again, the reason for the season is Jesus. He just did not just was born on Christmas Day, but he was born to die. And taking the communion is a reminder that you died for our sins because you love us so much. Thank you for this time, O oh Lord. Bless us and keep us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Please be seated.